Today, in the world of video games, compilations are about as common as a girl showing her butt in yoga pants on Instagram. They're everywhere. It's par for the course at this point. But back in the day, in the late 80s and the early 90s, that wasn't the case. Let's rewind back to the early 80s, back when watching VHS tapes on the EP slow speed and adjusting your rabbit ear antennas to get married with children to come in properly on your 8-inch CRT TV was about the best form of home entertainment you can get. Back then, chances are that video games were usually referred to as Atari by your parents. Oh, look at these lazy kids playing their Atari. Go outside and play. Yeah, okay, Gramps. Have another scotch with your breakfast, you boomer. Atari being synonymous with video games was obviously due in part to the Atari 2600 dominating the home console market in the late 70s and the early 80s, as well as having a landslide of amazing arcade games. It didn't matter what game you were playing, the older generation just referred a video game as Atari. But with the launch of the NES, that all changed. Nintendo bent Atari over a chair, and the word Nintendo overtook Atari as the company that became synonymous with video games. Hey, say what you will about the Atari 5200 and the 7800, it was garbage compared to the NES. Sure, the Atari 2600 has its charm. I even love it. It has its place in history, but the world was ready to move on to bigger and better things. And my god, they did. But... That might not have been the case if it wasn't for one video game. A video game that put Nintendo on the map. Yeah, you guessed it. Jaleco. Wait, what the? Oh wait, wrong card. Ah, here we go. Donkey Kong. Like the guy on the dollar bill, Donkey Kong needs no introduction. Designed by the legendary Shigeru Miyamoto and released in the arcades in 1981, Donkey Kong was one of the most, if not the most, advanced arcade games at the time of its release. Like trying to open up a condom wrapper with sweaty hands, it's hard to grasp how important this game was back then. Cutscenes to describe a plot, having multiple unique stages, the first game to introduce Mario, who was called Jumpman in this game, Donkey Kong pioneered the platform genre before the term platform even existed. Believe it or not, this was the first game to feature jumping. Yes, jumping. It's like the guy who invented toilet paper. What a time to be alive. Hey man, show some respect. GoldenEye on the N64 didn't have jumping, right? So this was a big deal. Like Mike and Molly jump roping on a glass floor, this game was groundbreaking. This was also the game that pretty much started the whole damsel in distress plotline. And many people don't know this, but that hot babe that Mario was trying to rescue is actually not Princess Peach. It's Pauline. Yes, that's right. Also, am I alone on this? But it's like, thank God there's another woman in Mario's life. It's like, dude, you're going to marry the first girl you're going to bang? Jesus Christ, have some pride, man. Anyway, so with Donkey Kong being a huge success in the arcades, it made sense to make a sequel, right? Of course. Like The Empire Strikes Back in James Cameron's Aliens, we got a superior sequel, Donkey Kong Jr., Released a year later in the arcades, this time, Mario is the antagonist and it's up to DK Jr. to rescue his old man. It's hard to believe, but Shigeru Miyamoto did the impossible and actually improved on the first game in many ways in every aspect of the platform genre. DK Jr. can jump, yeah, jump, grab vines, chains, ropes to climb higher on the screen, he can slide down faster by holding on one vine, or climb faster by holding two. Sounds familiar, right? <clears throat> Super Nintendo, huh, huh? It sounds very minute now, but these additions were huge back in 1982. This game was a masterpiece for its time. Hell, it still is. With these games being a huge success, it catapulted Nintendo into the empire that they are now. So, of course, it made sense to port these golden arcade success titles over to their new home console. And by God, these were awesome ports. Nintendo released these games under the label Arcade Classic Series, as you can see here. But at the time of these games' releases, these were hands down the best ports of these games. But they weren't perfect. Of course, during this time, you had to expect certain aspects and graphics of the game to be omitted, such as, you know, cutscenes, certain animations, etc. But the biggest issue with the port of the first Donkey Kong game was actually a missing level. The Cement Factory. In the arcade, there's four total levels, but on the NES port, there's only three, with the latter missing. But why is that? Well, it's all about timing, really. Back in 1983, NES carts only had 32 kilobytes of ROM to work with. The original NES Donkey Kong cartridge size was only about 16 kilobytes, and DK Jr. was about the same. It's a far cry from later released games such as Kirby Adventure, which was over 470 kilobytes, literally 29 times bigger. But you need to understand that Donkey Kong was a launch title for the Famicom in Japan back in 1983, and Kirby's Adventure came out in 1993, literally 10 years later. Now, the US version was released in 1986, but it was a total copy and paste from the 1983 Japanese version. 
But over the course of those 10 years, mappers, which were designed to extend the system and bypass its limitations, such as adding RAM to the cartridge or even extra sound channels, had become more popular and widely used than game cartridges as time went on. Hence why earlier games look way less advanced than later release games. Now, you figure, sure, they probably could have made Donkey Kong on a 32 kilobyte cartridge, but back then, ROMs were insanely expensive. So going with a 32 kilobyte ROM chip would have meant less profits. I mean, shit, look at the N64, for example. There's a reason why those games were way more expensive than PS1 games. Now, at the time, in 1983, the Famicom was brand new. It would have been a serious risk to spend all that money on bigger ROM chips. But risk aside, let's be serious for a minute. Was the cement factory level being emitted a big deal back then? Did most people notice it missing? Eh, probably not. And let me explain. Now, Donkey Kong is not an easy game for the average person. The average player in the arcade probably never saw much past the second screen, especially younger kids. In order to see the cement factory, you would have had to pass these levels in this order. 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, 1, and then BAM! Number 4, the cement factory. That's the seventh stage. That's when the cement factory shows up. Now, this was on an arcade cabinet where, you know, you had to pay a quarter to actually play a game, not hit the start button over and over again on an NES controller for free? Think about it, how many people actually made it to this level while playing on the arcade cabinet? Who knows, but if I had a guess, probably less than 5%. Shit, I know I never made it that far as a kid. Removing the cement factory probably made the most sense when it came to saving money in space. Plus, the cement factory was probably the level that took up the most memory. Think about it, not only are there cement pans moving left to right, but there's also the conveyor belts moving at different speeds, which of course, takes up more memory to code. And then you have to think about Mario's movements on those conveyor belts, plus all the sprite flickering. Whoa, 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 slow down. I see you typing in the comments section, and the answer is no, I don't have sex on a regular basis. But two years after the release of DK and DK Jr., this amazing compilation came out just in time for Christmas of 1988. And what do you know? So was this cartridge, although this one was used as a pack and title for the system. But seriously, these carts are literally everywhere. If you go into someone's basement, there's like a 10% chance you're going to find this thing next to a dead cat or in some dusty cardboard box. For its time, these compilations were released on a 48 kilobyte cart. Wait a minute, hold up. If Donkey Kong is on a 16 kilobyte cart and DK Jr. is 16 and 17 kilobytes around there, that adds up to 33, leaving 15 kilobytes. Oh. So they were lazy and they didn't want to add the level. Got it. The good old copy and paste and slap a new price tag on it. The typical money grab. Shit. Some things just never change, am I right? But hey, I can't complain. On the plus side, DK Jr. has all four levels on the NES port, making it a true, complete arcade port. So that alone makes up for it. But... The good news is that Nintendo did eventually add the Cement Factory to the game 20 years later when they re-released this game to commemorate Mario's 25th anniversary. Unfortunately, it was only available to Nintendo Club members for a short period of time, but today, you can obviously play the updated game through a, you know, an emulator, or you can even buy a repo card on eBay. Also, another cool thing about this compilation is this awesome glitch. Check it out. You gotta get Mario or Jumpman in the right position, and there he goes. Down to the bottom, all the way to the top of screen, and you're able to beat the level real quick. Gotta love it. In conclusion, at the time of its release, this was by far the best version of Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. on a home console. And trust me, I grew up playing the Atari 2600 version on this game. With only two levels and... Jesus Christ, look at these graphics. Ugh, my god. The NES port looks like a masterpiece compared to this thing. Anyway, even though this compilation is still missing the Cement Factory on the first Donkey Kong game, this is hands down one of the best carts to own on the NES. And like I said before, the port of DK Jr. has all the levels. Also think about it, you have two of the most iconic games ever on this thing. Owning this is like owning a piece of video game history. How can you call yourself a gamer and not own a copy of Donkey Kong? On eBay, this thing sells for under $20, and it's way cheaper than buying the individual games. But hey, if you're a collector and you want to get both of these games, pick them up as well. You won't be disappointed. The first two Donkey Kong games were, and will always be, an all-time favorite among video game fans, and for good reasons too. Sure, kids today won't appreciate its greatness like the older generations do, but there's no denying the legacy that Donkey Kong has cemented in the video game industry. Pun intended.